Now I'm going to share my screen. All right, can everybody see my uh, studio now? Can I get a thumbs up? Awesome. All right. So, um, if you, my 10 things are in this, I wrote a blog post about it. So, I'll put this in the chat if you wanted to follow along there. Um, where did my chat go? There we are. Um, if you want to follow along there, if you want to code along, I made a clone of this project that's on my machine in our studio cloud so you can if you have an our studio cloud account you can just log in there and code along all right so um the first um the first thing that when i was first learning r was really hard for me to get my head around was the importance of r knowing where your stuff is right and so um, the here package is one that I use all the time because it allows you to avoid all file path drama, right? So Jenny Bryant, who's an amazing R lady, works at our studio, um, <laughs> says that if you start your script with set WD equals this path on only your computer, she will come and set your computer on fire, which is kind of a, a somewhat terrifying thought. So her solution, um, this is not her package, but she, it's um, what the solution that she recommends everybody adopt to avoid um, your code only working on your computer because you are telling R that your data lives somewhere specific on your computer um, is to use the here package. So what I'm gonna do here is um, I'm gonna run this chunk to get these um, packages that I'm gonna use today. So you can see here I'm working in an R project called Favorite Things, and I have a folder here called Data, and in this um, folder there is a CSV called Practice Penguins. Now what I've done, um, the Palmer Penguins package by Alison Horst and Alison Hill is really great, um, super cute penguin data that is really tidy. It's like, um, it's nice practice data for teaching and playing with visualization. What I've done to it is mess it up a little bit so that I can um, show you how to clean names and other things. So we're going to read this practice penguin starter in, right? So um, when, back in, in my project. So the here package is nice in that it references everything to the top level of your project file. So if I, I've already, already loaded the here package, if I, type here, it'll tell me that R thinks everything, we're going to reference everything relative to this path. So this is on my computer in my documents, I have a folder called GitHub, and my project folder is called favorite things, right. So what I can do with the here package is reference everything relative to that so that I could give this whole folder to somebody else. And they could run it, they could run my project, they could run my script, because my everything um, is referenced to the top level of this um, this favorite things folder. So I'm going to read in this practice penguins data. Um, let's call it you know, classic practice. Make a new object called practice penguins. Um, I'm going to read this B. I'm going to tell R that I want to um, find the data here. So relative to the top level of this um, this uh, favorite things folder. And I've got a subfolder called data. So I'm going to refer to that in quotes. And then within that data folder, um, I have a CSV called practice penguins. All right. I'm going to read in this penguin data. Right. So um, the nice thing about here is that there are weird intricacies about where the default path is if you're working in an RMD versus in a script. Um, and this is the best way to make your script reproducible by somebody else. So I could give this whole folder to somebody else. And because R is gonna look for the data here relative to the top level of the project within the data folder, um, and there is a file called practice penguins, then somebody else could run this as easily as me. It's not specific to my computer. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So here is my first favorite thing. 
um, working in a project and using here makes for many less file path dramas. All right, so when we look at this practice penguins data, um, I often glimpse is one way to do it. I wanna look at um, what the variable names of these practice penguins data is. And you can see I've messed them up a little bit, right? So one of the things when somebody gives you data and those of you who work in teams where you get data from somewhere else, people tend not to think hard about what they call things, variables, when they're entering the data. And not to, only do they not really think very hard, they tend not to do it consistently. Um, and everybody has, every person who interacts with the data has a different system of naming variables. And so when you get a data set from wherever, from a student, from um, the data team, you are often, you come across variables that look like this, right? So not only are they inconsistently formatted, so some there are some capitals and some not. Um, sometimes there are underscores in the gaps and sometimes not. Um, and for some reason, um, bill length and flipper length have ticks on them. I, I don't even know why that is, right? So the janitor package um, is super helpful in, in one file swoop fixing and making these all consistent so that, and it's important because when you're, those of you who know, um, who code in R a lot, you type these variable names a lot. And so it's good to like enforce some, um, some consistency on them so that you know that all of the variable names are lowercase and have an underscore in the gap, right? So we're gonna fix these variable names. So the janitor package um, has a function called clean names. So what I'm gonna do is create a new, um, a new object called clean penguins. And I'm gonna take my practice penguins and pipe it into a, the clean names function. If I run that, and then we look, we can look at the names of this new um, clean penguins um, object. You can see that now they're just in one foul swoop, they are all lowercase with um, underscores in the gap, which is called snake case. So what I tend to do is when I'm reading data in, I do it in the first step, so I will like, read CSV and then by default, just add clean names at when you read the data in so that you never have to look at the dirty names. You can just like go with clean from the outset. All right, so clean names, second thing. Um, the other thing that took me a little while to work out how to do an R coming from Excel and SPSS um, was how to count things. So often you, the first thing you wanna do with the data set is clean the names. And then you wanna know, all right, how many participants do I have in this group versus that group? How many males and females do I have? Um, how many males and females do I have in each group, right? So the table um, function also from Janita is a bit like the count function from, um, from dplyr, but I find the formatting is a bit nicer and it automatically puts percentages um, in the little table and it's pipe friendly so you can, um, you can make a table and then pipe it into uh, to get a pretty formatted HTML, um, HTML table you can use GT right so let me show you so we've got our clean penguins and let's say I just wanted to know um, how many penguins there were in in each of the penguin species right so I say I want a table I want you to count the species and put them in a table. And so the format here is kind of nice. Um, it'll give you a percentage. And if you want to, you can assign that the, um, the output of that to a new object that you can then use in um, a ggplot, for example. So I can make a, a species data frame and use that to, to plot um, if you wanted to. So you can count here, I'm just counting how many um, how many penguins are in each species, but you can do kind of like cross tabs. So you can say, all right, I wanna know how many male and female penguins are there in each species. 
um, by just adding an extra variable. So if we go, um, I want species and sex, then it will give you, um, I'm going to swap my headphones because they're dying. Can you still hear me? Yes, good, all right. Um, now it will give you counts of how many male and female penguins and how many penguins we're missing um, sex data on for each species. There's also um, within the Janita package, um, there are also adorn, um, adorn functions. So if you go like, I want to see um, what functions are in the package. You can use the double colon to just um, flick up and down. So there are lots of these adorn functions that allow you to add things to your table. So I can just say I want to adorn, whoops, bad typing, adorn totals, and it'll give me a total along the bottom. Um, you can also say that you want the totals to go along the side um, with um, by specifying an argument in there, which I don't remember. But yeah, if you wanted five rows, you can do that as well. The other nice thing is that it's totally pipe friendly. The table function is pipe friendly and you can um, get it to make a knit to a nice um, HTML table in your knitted document by just piping a GT. So the GT package is, I think it's, it's a good tables or great tables, it's what GT stands for or something. Um, but you can get it to format quite nicely in your um, knitted HTML document by just piping a GT on there. All right. Um, questions so far? Totally interrupt me. Um, <clears throat> what's the output type of the tabby L function? I, I just call it table with a while. Table. <laughs> Is it a is, is it a data tape? Sorry, is it a data frame or is it a table? Or... Oh, good question. Um, if I if I do, um, I'm gonna do this right. I'm gonna get this thing and then um, class. Uh, oh yeah, I class. Can class. Like this. Data frame. Okay. Yeah. Good question. Thanks, Jen. Welcome. Any other questions? Oh, thanks, Margaret. Yes, the back ticks are because the space is in the name, which you I mostly don't want. So clean names gets rid of those spaces and puts the underscore. I, I have a question. So yeah. it, it's nice to have uh, ability to count things for one column, but normally with the work like that, you do want to automate it to do it for majority of columns rather than one. Mm -hmm. Am I correct that it, it is possible to, to to use something like L apply, S apply? Yeah, so I think you could, I'm not so good at L apply and S apply. I've seen people do it with math. So per, mm -hmm. you can have it spit out your, spit your account table um, using that. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you could wrap a, um, iterative around it so that it would give you for yep. all of them. And in terms of table specifically, is, is there is a way to pass the list of the columns or it only takes one column? Yeah. Mm. Actually, you did spaces and sex. You did pass. Uh, yeah, yeah. So you, yes. I think. Sorry. <laughs> I've, I, I've done two. I wonder if it will do more than that. Um, I'm just trying to think in this data. About to ask that. Will it do more than what? What else have we got that we might I, be able I to do? I found it on Stack Exchange. There's it a does? little. It, there's a. There's a particular use dot data thing. I'll I'll put the link for the Stack Overflow. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks. Um. So the let's see if it'll do more than two. So we have in the Clean Penguins. We also have information about islands. So we could do, well, well, no, that's 
I, yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Yes. Someone had that problem. Yeah. And the dot data was the solution to be able to pass a list into table. So I just put the link there. Awesome. It's, it's, it's a little bit fiddly, but it is solved. It's possible. All right. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Jade. All right. Cool. Um, so we can see in our penguins data here that we have some penguins that are missing information about um, whether they are male or female. And so once you have kind of counted how many participants you have in each condition or how many participants are in each sex in each condition, you kind of want to know, okay, how much missing data am I dealing with, right? So the NANIA package um, by Nick Tierney is a really great way for, of dealing with um, missing or NAs in your data. And my favorite function from it is business, which just gives you a visual overview of how bad your missing data problem is, right? So if we, I'm gonna take this, um, the clean penguins, um, and I'm gonna type it into a business. And it gives you something that looks kind of like this, right? So we can see that in the sex column, this is the missing data that we knew about before because those there were NAs when we tried to count how many male and female penguins we had. But these super skinny lines tells us that for a few penguins, we're missing not just sex, but also um, information about all the other variables that we're interested in. Right? So yeah, um, depending on your situation, you might deal with that, that missing data differently. But um, I really like this business package, this business function for just getting an overview of how, where your data is missing and how bad your problem might be. All right, so that's number four. Um, okay, so the other, um, the next hard thing when I was learning R from someone who was coming from Excel and SPSS was, Gigi plots obsession with long data, right? So usually when you are entering data in, Excel, in the Excel sheet, you enter it wide just because that's easier. But when um, working with data in R, R mostly wants your data to be long and tidy. So you are only supposed to have information about a single um, observation in a cell and um, you want to have rather than in this case, this is not the penguin data is not a great example, but in this case, technically, we have this is pretty tidy data. But for we could argue that this these columns about bill measurements are technically wide, right? Because we're measuring different parts of the bill, we have measurements in centimeters, maybe we could make we could make this data a tiny bit tidier. Go with me, it's not a great example, but um, we could make it a tiny bit tidier by pulling all of those measurement data, measurement values into a single um, variable and then having another variable that's what part of the bill are we measuring, right? So the pivot functions um, make this much, so much easier than the old gather and spread functions. So these are relatively new, I mean, couple of years old. So what I'm going to do first is just um, select to make the problem smaller. I'm going to select just the parts, um, the variables I want to make um, long. So I'm going to take, um, let's see, I'm going to take my clean penguins. And let's imagine I'm just interested in what I'm interested in. I want BC, sex, and then the things that start with bill, right? Um, so I'm gonna select species and sex, and then things that start with, oops, bad typing, start with bill. Whoops, here we go, in a bracket, close in a bracket. Um, all right, so, and I call this field data. Oh, 
Okay, so I'm gonna run this chunk and we end up with a new thing that just has species sex and the things that start with Bill, right? And what I wanna do is pivot these Bill columns into one column that just has the measurements in it and a different column that has what part of the Bill we're measuring. Um, and so I'm gonna do that with the pivot longer function. So here we have, I'm gonna go call this new thing, long bill data. I'm gonna take a bill data and pipe it into pivot longer. And pivot longer wants to know mainly three things. What the names of the, um, what the names, the name of the column that is currently the names of the variables will go to, right? So we want to take our names to, I'm gonna make a new column called um, bill um, part. So the part of the bill, whether we're getting the length or the depth. And then we want another new column that the values are gonna to go to. And so we wanna call this bill measurement. And then we want to know oops, um, which, which columns are currently wide that we want to make long. So we can say we have build data, we want to make build length and build depth. So then it's a, we can go build length through build depth. Often you're dealing with more than just two, right? So this using a column to say the, the range of, of columns that are currently um, wide that you want to make long, but um, column is useful. All right, so let's see if that'll run. So we have now a new thing in our, um, a new object called long build data. And you can see that now that we, we have two new columns, one that has length and depth for, for penguin one, and length and depth for penguin two, and length and depth for penguin three, with the measurements all in a single column, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, questions before I go on? No? All right, so um, <clears throat> let's make a plot of that. Um, Maybe we are interested in, what have we got? We've got species and bill. Let's make a separate plot for length and depth. So we'll do that by facet. And then maybe we're interested in bill measurements by species, right? Um, and I'm gonna color the species differently so that I can show you how to easily remove the legend using this GG easy package. So, so often the cut, once you've got your plot in ggplot, that's the easy part because making it look exactly how you want requires lots of Googling and changing of themes and things that should be relatively easy, like removing the legend when it contains extra information that you don't need, um, are actually not that easy, right? So this GG easy package uh, is essentially really simple wrappers for commonly used ggplot things. So the easy remove legend is a good example. So let me, let's make a plot so that um, I can show you how to easily remove the legend. So we now have this long build data. I'm gonna pipe that into ggplot. And on the x-axis, I want species. And on the y-axis, I want, what have I got? Bill measurement. And I want to color the, I'm going to do a few on points. So I want to color the points by species. And add a geom point. Um, and I want to get a separate plot for depth measurements versus length measurements. So I'm going to add a facet wrap to 
um, get, what they call that in the end, build part in separate plots. All right, what is that? Unmatched. Let's put that on a pink sign. Okay. Aha. All right. Will that open bigger? Oh, yes. That one does. All right. So, a couple of things about this plot. I want to add this germ point is good, except when you have data about penguins who there is zero, well, not zero variability, but not so much variability in penguins. So I want to add a little bit of noise to this jitter so that the points don't end up all on top of each other. So I'm going to, instead of jam point, I'm going to try jitter, jam jitter. Aha, all right. And then um, they still, the points are still quite all on top of each other. So sometimes I find adding transparency to the points can help you see where they are dense um, and not. So I'm going to, to my jitter, I'm going to say alpha, which is transparency, um, 5.5. Ah, better. All right. So now we can see um, that there is very little um, <laughs> variability in, in build depth, but much more in build length. All right. So, um, here, because I've got species on the x-axis, um, I don't necessarily need this legend. But in order to get rid of it, I have to Google it every time. Like it's theme something equals it. Yeah, I never remember, right? But the GG Easy package is um, super easy. You can add a easy and then you can scroll up and down for all the things you google all the time right so here we go easy remove legend we run that then it gets rid of the legend so um yeah the gg easy package has um easy wrappers for changing the font and adding a title and all the things that you never remember how to do. Um, GG Easy is your friend. All right, that looks pretty good. So um, the other thing that I find myself doing all the time is making new conditional variables based on your data, right? So maybe I wanted to find, in my case, I want to find the babies who's, who have fewer than X number of trials in their data set. And I wanna like color code them in my plot. These are babies who only scraped through the experiment versus those who aced it, right? And so you can make new conditional variables based on data you have um, using case when from dplyr. So let's imagine that, um, where let's imagine we're interested in these Gen 2 penguins and we want to know um, whether these ones that sit way up here are outliers relative to the other penguins um, in terms of are they do they have really long bills, right? So let's make a new variable that um, codes for whether each of those bill length um, values are more or less than two standard deviations above the mean for those gen twos. So <clears throat> we'll start, let's take our clean penguins and let's make the problem smaller. We're only interested in the gen twos. So I'm going to filter um, and say I only want the species um, equals gen two. Um, and I'm working here, I'm working with the original clean penguins, not the long ones. So I'm going to just select, I'm only interested in bill length. So I'm just going to select um, bill length and species and sex, let's say. So I'm filtering for just the species uh, gen two, and then I want to select 
um, just the variables. So species the filter is filtering just the rows where species equals gen two, and select is taking is selecting just certain variables and um, or just certain columns. So here I want to pull out just species and um, fill length and Right. And then I'm going to assign that to a new object. We call this Gen2. Check we've got what we want. So we're down to 124 observations. We've just got the Gen2s, just their build length and, um, and the sex. All right. So um, I want to know whether for, for each of these values of build length, whether that is more than two standard deviations above or below the mean for these Gen2 penguins. So I'm going to create a couple of um, values in my environment to capture the mean and standard deviation to do that. So let's create a new thing in our environment that is the mean length of these bills. And so we can say, um, get the mean. And here I'm saying the data frame I want you to get the mean of is Gen2. You can use the dollar sign to pull just the bill length. Um, and here, oh, it's telling me I have NAs. <clears throat> no, it's not going to calculate the mean because there are NAs in that column. So if I just add NARM, so NA remove equals true, whoops, it will give me any. All right, so that's the mean length um, for these Gen 2 penguins. And then I'm going to do the same, I'm just going to copy and paste it and change this to standard deviation. And so if I run this line, then I'll end up with a value that is in my environment that I can then refer to in my case when, when I'm trying to assign these Gen2 penguins as either with ordinary length bills or very long or very short length bills. All right, <clears throat> so now I wanna create a new column in my Gen2 data. So at the moment, I've just got species and bill length and sex. I want to create a new column that codes whether each penguin's bill is very long or very short or just ordinary, right? So when you want to create a new column, um, you can use mutate. So I'm going to take my Gen2 data and I'm just going to overwrite it. So when you're adding a new column, you can just overwrite the name of your object. So um, I want to take my Gen2 data and I want to mutate a new column. I'm going to call this column, I'm going to call it um, be long short. And I want the values of that column to depend on the values of um, bill length and whether they're more or less than two standard deviations um, above or um, different from the mean. Right, so I want to use case when, and I'm going to say, all right, case when when bill length is greater than, and then I'm going to refer to this um, this value greater than the mean length plus two time and then this value right two times fd length then in that column use a little tilde to say all right in that cell if this is true then i want you to say that that penguin has a long bill right let's see if that will run all right so we look at this gen 2 penguin again you see that most of these penguins don't meet that criteria. Oh, there's one, right? So this at row 34, this guy with a bill length of 59.6, that is more than two standard deviations above the mean for all of these gentle penguins. Are there any more? Here's another one, right? So it's relatively rare. It's like penguins are totally different to babies. There isn't very much variability in penguins. There's a lot in babies, right? So, <clears throat> what about if the um, 
the bill is short, right? So I'm gonna add, I'm gonna put a comma there and then say, okay, if, alternatively, if the bill length, whoops, bad typing, is less than the mean, um, minus two times the standard deviation, then, whoops, bad typing, then I want you to put in that cell, so the tilde, if the bill length for that penguin is less than the mean minus two standard deviations, then put short in that, in that cell, right? So we run that and check. Okay, oh, there's a little one, a little female, short, long, long, not very many penguins with small, short bills, as it turns out. Okay, so what about all those NAs? We want like something in those cells that don't meet these two criteria, right? And so there's one more argument that you can add here that you say um, true equals ordinary, right? So if I kind of read this as if neither of those things are true, then put ordinary, although yeah, the logic of that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but this is what it is, true, put ordinary. So yeah. in theory, yes. The, does the order matter? Yes, yeah. So <clears throat> I've used this before um, in, so I had kids doing a memory task and they could either fail, they could fail those memory tasks for one of three reasons. Um, they either don't remember, or they can't, um, <clears throat> they can't, um, uh, they can't tell you why they're choosing the thing that they choose, or they just prefer the one that they chose. And the order of those things matter. And so you can put them in order so that you say, all right, if you don't remember, then you fail, right? But maybe you remember, except you make a wrong decision for another reason. So yeah, the order does matter. Unlike, I think if else, I think this is where case when is better than if else. It's a little more powerful because the order is important. Yeah. Um, all right. So if we run that. We should end up with gentoo that are mostly ordinary, right? Um, so there are a few. Actually, let's use, use table so we can see how many. All right. So now we have this new thing, um, uh, gentoo penguins. And if we say we want to count how many fall into each of those long, short categories that we just made using case point. We can see that, oh, right, yes. Most penguins have <laughs> bill lengths that are within two standard deviations of the mean. There are four that have count as um, outliers and that have long and one that has a very short bill. Does that make sense? Questions? No questions, this is awesome. Um, okay, so um, a relatively new function in dplyr that has made, has just fixed lots of things. So when you use mutate to make a new variable, um, on the penguin star, it doesn't really matter because you've, in the original data, how many do we have? Um, there's only, where did my, um, practice penguins, how many observate, how many variables do we have? There's only half a dozen of them, right? Um, eight, right? So in the penguin study, you only have eight columns. So you can see them all most of the time. Um, in the kind of data that I work with, like sometimes have hundreds of columns. And when you make a new column using mutate, the default is to put it at the end, like several pages that way that you have to scroll across and across and across and across to see whether it's done what you want it to do, right? You can pipe after your, after your mutate, you can pipe a relocate on the end of your, um, on the end of your code to move it to a place that makes more sense, right? So here we only have a few, but let's try that um, 
So let's, I'm going to copy this down. Here I'm mutating this long short. Um, and in the original, it just puts it the last column. In this case, it's fourth. I let's say I want it to go next to or after the bill length. Um, so you can add a pipe and just say relocate. And I want to relocate my new short long, long short dot um, column. And you say dot after equals um, bill length. Right. So I'm saying I want to move or relocate this new column that I've made and I want you to put it after the variable called bill length. So if I run that one now, now you can see that it's moved this new one rather than being tagged on the right hand side, it's moved it right next to the data that it is um, it relates to, which is super helpful when you've got hundreds of variables and you're creating a new one that falls at position 256 when you actually want to be able to see it on the screen. All right, that is my number eight. Now I'm just going to make a, a, a Gen 2 plot here, just not for any good reason other than it's going to help me um, show you the magic of this knit R thing. So let's make a Gen 2 plot. Um, I'm going to go ggplot and I want, what do I have in this Gen 2 thing? I want maybe, um, I want to color the points by this new long short thing that I just made. So let's say I want, um, I'm going to put six on the x axis and I want to plot the bill length and I want to color by the new thing that I just made, which I called long short. And I want to get better again. Let's see what that looks like. Okay. Um, okay, that jitter, it's added a bit too much width noise. So I'm going to kind of pull it back in a little bit so that they don't overlap quite so much by just going, now this is, I'm just picking a number at random. I don't, don't know what this is going to do, 0.5. Ooh, worse, hang on. Let's go by two. Oops, just lost my other paper sign. Can you hear me? Yep, good. All right, point two is better. Let's try point one, see what that looks like. I like point two better. All right. All right. Um, so in this case, I'm going to leave the legend because it, I want to know that these orange ones are long and the, this little blue one is short. Um, <clears throat> so the reason I wanted to add another plot to this, um, to this RMD document is just to illustrate um, how you can use the knit R settings to save all the figures in your, every time you knit the document, it will save a PNG version of the figures in a folder um, within your project, which is useful if you're wanting to like put them into a manuscript um, or send them to somebody who doesn't use R. You want them in a in an exported format. So <clears throat> the manual way to do that is to go to use GD save, right? So let's say I wanted to save this Gen 2 plot as a PNG, and I could run that. Oops. <clears throat> oh yeah, it saved it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Post COVID wrote. Done a lot of talk now. Um, all right. So you can see here that I now have this Gen 2.png um, in my in my folder. So um, that you can do that for every plot that you want to export, or you can use the knit R um, fig path options to have it do that for you automatically. 
right? So um, I want to let's go back up to the top. You'll notice there's a chunk that whenever you make a markdown document, a chunk that looks like this ends up in the top of your document and you mostly just ignore it and start writing underneath, right? But you can use this setup chunk to set defaults for your document that save you time down the bottom, right? So um, what I typically do, so echo equals true, I think someone correct me. I think echo means that you want to see both the code and the output that it produces. Um, that's um, the default. You can change that if you want. If you just wanted, if you're making a report for your boss and you just wanted them to see the plots and not the code that produces them, you could say echo equals false and then it would just, um, it would give you just the output, I think. The other way to do that, to work these code is this little, um, these options in the cog, you can choose, um, yeah, echo is show code and output, but if you change that, it's echo equals false to show the output only, okay? Um, okay, so that's the default, but you can add options here that set defaults for your whole document. So you can control the size of your ggplots as they appear in your knitted document using um, fig.width. So let's say I want my, the width of all my plots to be eight and the height um, of the plots to be six, making it up. Um, you can set these fig widths and heights within the chunk that makes each ggplot if you want to, or if you want all of your plots to be the same size in your knitted document, then you can set the default for the whole document in this options chunk. All right, so setting the, um, the fig width and height is nice, but you can also have it, you can set a fig path to have it export a PNG version of each of your plots into a folder within your document. So I've got a folder here called fix, and I'm going to tell R that I want you to um, export each of the um, figures in PNG format to this folder called figs when it knits. The other nice default um, that you can set within this chunk is the theme for your ggplot. So I haven't changed any theme options um, in any of the plots down here. They are all this nasty gray theme, which I really dislike. I usually go with theme classic because it um, is the closest to APA style. It gives a white, white background and black axes. Um, so you can do that by adding a theme to every one of your plots. So I could, if I wanted to change the theme of this one, I could say um, theme plus theme classic. And then it would end up looking like, oh, oh, bad. Okay. Oh, wow. Why did that do that? Huh. Does it look bad when I make it bigger? Oh, I don't know what's happened to that. Uh, that's area. because all your plots are supposed to be eight by six right now. It made them tiny pixels. Oh. You did your figure height and width up the top. But that, oh, that's interesting. So that doesn't work. That isn't just when I knit. I Apparently. thought, okay, let's test this, hmm. right? I thought that this changing preferences here only changes things when you knit because it's like, knit according to these things. I'm, I'm guessing, but. Interesting. All right, so, okay. If you wanted to change the theme individually, you just add plus theme, whatever you like, theme BW or theme classic or whatever your favorite is. If you want all of your plots to have a theme, then you can set the theme in this knit um, setup chunk. So I can say I want a theme set and my favorite is classic. 
like this. And that will set all of the theme, all of my plots to be classically themed. Um, even though I don't, I haven't added plus theme classic on each of them. All right, let's test this. So I'm gonna say net. Oh no, could not find function. Ooh. It says theme class. Uh, theme classic. Oh, thank you. Bad typing. All right, let's try that again. So I'm gonna use net and cross my fingers. Theme set. Have I? What have I done? Um, you did the libraries yeah. to that chunk. Haha. <laughs> All right. Order makes a difference. All right. I'm going to put this under and put it here. All right. Try that again. Knit. <laughs> okay. I'm going to stop sharing and share this other one to see what that did. All right. So you guys can see my knitted document now. Awesome. All right. So if we scroll all the way down um, to the plot. Right. So it's it didn't look anywhere near it, the size has changed, but it's not quite as crazy in the knitted document as it was in the output when I just knitted the chunk. So it's applied theme classic and changed the size to what I want um, within my knitted document. There we go. Excellent. Um, but also, if all has gone well, let me try again over here. If all has gone well, I can look in my fig folder down here and I've got a, a PNG version of each of the plots from, including the business, that's interesting, um, each of the plots that I made within the knitted document. Now, what's nice, the reason um, for the longest time I didn't really label my um, chunks. So see, when you insert a new chunk here, the default is to do three back ticks and a curly brace and an R and a closed curly brace. You can add a label to every chunk um, and for the longest time, I didn't really know why people would bother because you don't actually see that <laughs> in your document. So why would you do that? Um, I've started being a bit more mindful about it and doing it particularly for chunks that produce plots because um, if, so you'll see down, if I find one of them. All right, so here I've labeled this chunk, the build part plot. And when it knits, it uses that chunk label as the file name for the plot that it exports, which is handy because then you can look in the folder and you actually know what each of these plots are. Um, if you don't label them, then it just gives them a default and you have to like open them to see what they are. But yeah. So using this labeling system is useful when you want to um, use NIDA to get your exported plots. Um, and I've got my headphones again. Uh, labeling chunks has another advantage in that it also updates the navigation bar at the top, uh, at the bottom of the screen. So where it says chunk 12 bill part. Oh. oh. Margaret, I think you just made my day. Okay. It, al it also, um, for prose, I believe it does the heading above it, but for chunks, it uses the chunk name if there is one. Oh, okay. Because I had always kind of navigated using, I call these my, the pancakes over here, but that's only your text headings, not actual chunks. So if you have lots of chunks, underneath a heading and you want to navigate to a particular one that's super handy thank you awesome i always come away from these things learning something so good all right so my last my last tip is um is writing data so most often my kind of workflow is 
read in some really messy, ugly, not at all tidy data, pull it into something that um, is formatted so that I can ggplot it and then export that clean data and then read it into a new script that is for visualization. So I have a script that is about cleaning and a script that's about a visualization and a script that's about um, statistics. And so most often I wanna read in dirty data, do this process to it and then output it to a CSV that I can then read into a different script. And so write CSV works exactly in reverse to read CSV. Um, so if you, let's say let's say we want to we want to write this Gen two data, um, you can say we've got our Gen two data and we want to write CSV, and let's say I'm gonna add a new folder just for like clean data. So within my data folder, I now have another folder called clean, um, and so I can use here in exactly the same way to say. All right, I want you to write this Gen2 data and put it in the, in the folder called data within the subfolder called clean data. And I want you to call it gen2.csv. So we run that within this clean data folder. We now have a new CSV called Gen2 that we could read into whatever is next in our um, analysis process. So that's my 10 favorite things. Questions? before I ask you to show me your favorite thing. Uh, I have a slightly tangential question, perhaps on um, the, the context within which you um, showed us these things, namely you used a project. I'm not that yes. familiar with projects and wanted to ask yeah. uh, what role they play in general in, when working with R. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think projects, I, I think of projects as kind of like an umbrella that holds together all the different parts of your data analysis process for a given project that you're working on. And the nice thing about them is that um, it helps with reproducibility. So um, when you don't work within a project, you have to tell R where to find stuff relative to your machine. Whereas working within a project, you can tell R relative to this project, here's where stuff lives, um, which makes it, which means that I could, I could um, take this favorite things folder that contains an, it contains an R proj file. Um, as well as a folder that has my data and a folder that has my figures, then I will often have a folder that has scripts. Um, and I could zip that favorite things folder and send it to you. And mm -hmm. you could open it on your machine and you would just open the R proj file and it would open and look exactly the same as on mine, right? So I think of the main advantage is for reproducibility. So when everything is contained in this umbrella, you can kind of close up your umbrella, zip it and send it to somebody else. And the code works exactly the same on their machine as it does on yours. Does anybody have other advantages for using projects that they want to share? Uh, mainly for the here package. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, the thing, the nice thing about using a project in here is that it doesn't matter whether it's your machine or somebody else's. It doesn't matter whether it's Windows or Mac. So there are like weird flash um, differences between Windows and Mac and weird defaults about what the root of your directory is, depending on what operating system your machine is running on using a project and then referring to everything via the here package kind of gets rid of all of those inconsistencies across different um, setups, which can save you much drama. I think it provides good programming practices, so it's good. Yeah. That's, so kind of piggybacking on that, mm -hmm. you've got your 
having the figures and the data within the project makes sense. Mm -hmm. If the data that you're reading in is shared, so if it's from a shared folder that's not inside your R project folder and other people are accessing that as well, um, do you have a easy way to work with that? So like the data folders outside of your project umbrella. I think if the, the data source is shared, then it's in a fixed location. Yeah. Um, and so you just refer to it directly. Yeah. 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 So maybe so when I, I say I, we, we, I usually set like um because this happens in the Python land all, all the time, everyone just sets their own uh their own variable that means this is where I keep all of the data files and this is where I keep all the models and this is where I keep all the yeah. everything, and then just refer to that variable name rather than uh having a set folder. Just if there was a shortcut or a package or something that heared that, you know. Yeah, so that you mean, but that um, field is different on everybody's computer. Is, is that what you're saying? Um, the, the, the variable name, we've agreed to use the same variable name. So we'll all use uh, models folder but right. the value will be whatever it is locally for each person. Right, yeah. yeah. So I think... Um, uh, we'll just have our config variables set. Yeah, that, that makes sense. So it's I think as long as everybody you're collaborating, there's like shared understanding. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think yeah. that's, that's a team practice that totally makes sense. Okay. Um, I think the advantage for projects is that you can kind of, it's almost, it's almost imposed, yeah. right? When you haven't come to those understandings and you need a way around, um, projects are helpful, yeah. Other questions? I'm curious if you have a list of what didn't make it onto the top 10 list. <laughs> what's, what, what's your medium short list? <laughs> <laughs> medium short list? Um, I decided that GG annotate was probably a little bit too bespoke. Um, so GG, so I like, there are lots of packages that are GG, GG plot add-ons. So mm -hmm. GG annotate is a good one that allows you, it's a, like a shiny app where um, you can put annotations so you can like add an arrow and this outlier to um, to ggplots. Um, what else didn't make it? I have a list in my like a in my notebook handwritten list that is not in my COVID adult memory. But um, <laughs> what else is on there? There are um, oh ggpubr is again um a gg plot add-in that allows you to do things that are useful to academics like add error add um lines that have statistical significance between your plots and add actually add in um uh let's say you're doing a scatter plot you can add values for a correlation coefficient onto the plot using gg um and then there's like silly things like making memes. You can the meme R package to make memes and R. You know. That's important. Favorite. That's important. The favorite thing. 